Grigory Yefimovich Rasputin was one of history's most famous Russians. He's known as a mystic, a prophet, a healer, but also a degenerate, a womanizer, and a manipulative con man. There is an otherworldly, almost satanic mythos about the man. The problem is, a lot of what we know about Rasputin isn't really true. Almost every biographical work on him is built on legends, myths, or outright lies. But recent reporting has breathed new life into the legend of Rasputin, making it easier to tell fact from fiction. As it turns out, some of the most famous Rasputin tales are lies, and some of the most incredible are absolutely true. Rasputin was a complicated, terrible, great, and mysterious man. So let's start at the beginning. The Rasputin family's roots lie in the far north of Siberia, a remote region in western Russia. At some point, for some reason, Rasputin's parents moved from northern Siberia to a village called Pokrovskoye. Located in a corner of western Siberia, Pokrovskoye is a tiny village on the river Tura. Indeed, if not being famous as the birthplace of Grigory Rasputin, Pokrovskaya would be entirely anonymous today. In the 1800s, Pokrovskaya would have been the quintessential Russian village, sparsely populated by peasants who mostly spent their time working in fields and going to church. Rasputin's parents fit perfectly into these scenes. His father, Yefim, was a peasant farmer and a church elder. Yefim also worked as a government courier, driving a cart between the nearby cities of Tobolsk and Tumien. In 1863, Yefim married Anna Parshukova. The couple bore nine children, seven of which died in childhood. Grigory was the first to survive. Perhaps being the first surviving child spoke to Rasputin's later seemingly unstoppable will as a force of nature. Perhaps Grigory just got lucky. Indeed, this conversation, luck versus something more, is one that will follow Rasputin throughout his whole life, but we'll get there later. Historians recently found Siberian records to indicate that Grigory Rasputin was born in January of 1869, but for many, many years, no one knew when he was even born. Really, the first 30-odd years of Rasputin's life are a black hole shrouded in mystery. No photos exist of him as a child or even without a beard, and there's almost no information about his youth. Indeed, why would there be? Rasputin was born into the anonymous, impoverished life of the Russian peasant. In Siberia, he likely spent his youth as such, working in fields, going to church, eventually getting married early, and having as many kids as he could produce. We can assume this, or some version of it, was the bulk of Rasputin's early life. He was uneducated and likely illiterate, as was typical for Siberian peasants at the time. It seems Rasputin was quite hot-tempered and unruly in his youth. As a teenager, he essentially cussed out his local mayor and spent two days in the village jail. This is really the only documented information we have about Rasputin's childhood. There are other tales of him stealing horses and committing petty crimes, but none of these have been verified by historical record. At some point, Rasputin began going on small religious pilgrimages to neighboring villages. In one of these journeys, he met a woman named Praskovia Dubrovina. She traveled with him back to Pakrovskoye, where they got married and had three children. We don't know much about his wife, but it seems most of her life was spent suffering, directly or indirectly, at the hands of Rasputin. Life with him was not easy. He drank excessively and was a serial womanizer. But Raskovia did stay dedicated to him and supported him till his death. After Rasputin's eventual death and the Russian Revolution, Raskovia and his son Ivan died in a gulag. It was basically a miserable ending to a miserable life. But let's get back to Rasputin, because at some point, his life changed dramatically. No one knows what happened, and no one may ever know. But in his late 20s, Rasputin had a sudden, radical change in his life. He would later write that he had a vision of the Virgin Mary. This vision, or whatever happened, compelled Rasputin to go on a pilgrimage across Russia. It was also during this pilgrimage that Rasputin encountered more mystical, perhaps darker, sides of Christianity. You see, in the countryside, Orthodox Christianity was still infused with the sort of undercurrents of paganism. Eventually, Rasputin met an elder named Makary in the town of Verkhoturia. Through Makary, Rasputin met all kinds of fringe and extremist Christian groups, including the Clists. 
The Clists were a sect of Christians who infused their teachings with the mystical and occult. Some scholars believe they engaged in group sinning. This was basically a frantic, frenzied sexual orgy. Their idea was that by sinning one could repent and by repenting you became closer to God. There's nothing to indicate that Rasputin was ever part of the Clists. But these are the types of people he would have seen. And indeed it seems these ideas were foundational in his approach to Christianity. Rasputin eventually returned to Pokrovskaya a changed man, inside and out. He became a vegetarian, claimed to have sworn off alcohol, and began praying more frequently and intensely than ever before. Whatever he was looking for, it seems like he found it, or some version of it anyways. Starting in 1897, Rasputin would regularly just pack his things and wander across the Russian Empire, seeking some sort of religious enlightenment. This type of journey, called a stranik, was actually very normal at the time in Russia. It was likely there were a million wanderers across the empire on their own journeys. These wanderers traveled in simple clothes, living like beggars as they went from church to church in seek of enlightenment. In his later autobiography, Rasputin discussed his journeys. I rarely got to eat on only potatoes. I did not have money and never saved. God would have to send someone to allow me to lodge. There I would eat. More than once I walked to Kiev from Tobolsk, not changing underwear for half a year. Not rarely I walked for three days straight, eating only a little. On hot days I imposed on myself the fast. I worked with day laborers, I worked and ran for rest to pray. When I herded horses, I prayed. It all sounds pretty miserable. On his Stranik, Rasputin was humiliated by the higher classes of society. He was regularly beaten and robbed by thieves. This time served as Rasputin's school of life, if you will. During these years, he witnessed all parts of Russia and its population, from beggars and thieves in the countryside to aristocrats in Russia's largest cities. He gained a bit of literacy on his travels, but mostly Rasputin learned the scripture by memorization. As he learned and he preached, Rasputin realized he had a gift. Formerly trained church officials preached in a way that was rigid and almost abstract, entirely removed from the everyday lives of the people. Rasputin, though, could infuse the scripture with a sort of unrefined peasant perspective that gave the writings a sense of relevance. He preached Russian orthodoxy in a way that was tremendously charismatic to lay people. This unique type of charisma set Rasputin apart from his peers in the church. Rasputin's appearance was also particularly striking. Even in photos, you can tell. He was taller than most and had deep, heavy-set eyes that were a green-gray color. Combined with his long beard, skinny frame, and black clothing, Rasputin realized that his presence held some power. This was something that he astutely honed in on and utilized for the rest of his life. By the early 1900s, Rasputin's preachings had earned him a small circle of followers. These were mostly distant family members and peasants who prayed with him in Pakrovskaya. Rasputin constructed a chapel in his father's root cellar and held secretive congregations there. These meetings fueled rumors, speculation, and even hostility from the village. It was said there were distinctly sexual elements to his church services, which is very likely true based on patterns later in Rasputin's life. And yet, all of this was little more than a beginning for Grigory Rasputin. Word of Rasputin's unique style of preaching quickly spread around Siberia. Put simply, he was a local celebrity. In the city of Kazan specifically, Rasputin earned a reputation as a great spiritual healer. In Kazan, local religious leaders were impressed by Rasputin and arranged for him to travel to St. Petersburg and meet high-ranking bishops in Russia's then-capital city. This was in 1904, and Rasputin would have been about 35 years old. Peasant class in Russia, people like Rasputin, carried a version of Christianity that, again, was infused with shades of paganism and the occult. Russian elites in St. Petersburg believed these teachings were unsullied by metropolitan intellectualism and had merit as a more pure version of the faith. These elites in the church and government had a great interest in this alternative, mystical approach to Christianity. So, Rasputin showed up at a pretty good time. In the capital, St. Petersburg, people just latched on to Rasputin really quickly. Indeed, Rasputin developed a small following in the aristocratic circles of St. Petersburg. Allegedly, Rasputin could heal physical aches and pains with the wave of his hand. 
His charismatic demeanor proved to be very calming. His audience was mostly women, and this was likely no mistake. Rasputin taught that through sinning, often sexual, you could gain God's forgiveness and get closer to the Lord. His followers saw Rasputin as something pretty close to a deity, both philosophically and sexually. At this point, Rasputin was only a few steps removed from the royal Romanov family. And one day, he met two sisters, famously known as the Black Crows. Milica and Anastasia were royalty from Montenegro, who had married into the Romanov family. His two sisters introduced Rasputin to Tsar Nicholas and his wife, the Tsarina Alexandra Romanov. The Tsar and Tsarina were perfectly primed for Rasputin to wander into their life for a lot of reasons, and to understand at all why Rasputin would eventually hold so much power over the Romanovs, we do need to understand the royal couple. Because you see, Rasputin was not the Romanovs' first brush with the occult. Before meeting Rasputin, the Tsarina had an advisor named Nizier Philippe. Born in Lyon, France, Philippe was a self-proclaimed mystic and healer. He had been brought to Russia by members of the Romanov family, where he was introduced to the Tsar and Tsarina. Like most aristocrats, they were already quite fascinated with the occult, and so they were immediately taken by Philippe. He served as their advisor, often meeting with the royal family to discuss his visions, prophecies, and what have you. But most importantly, Philippe claimed to have powers that could help Alexandra give birth to a son. Only a man could become the sole ruler of Russia. So as Tsarina, giving birth to a son, an heir to the throne, was basically the only thing expected of Alexandra. But up until she met Philippe, Alexandra had given birth to four daughters in a row. The aristocracy and Alexandra herself were very worried that she could not produce an heir. Alexandra authentically believed Philippe had mystical powers that could make her produce a male child. And so he hung around for several years, gaining increasing influence over the royal family. But there's also an increasing distaste for Philippe because he was not Russian. People didn't want some foreign person exercising power over the Russian Empire. Eventually this kind of boiled over and the family had to send Philippe back to France. But before Philippe left, he offered one final prophecy. He told the Tsarina not to worry, that God would soon send another mystic in his place. Not long after, Rasputin showed up. So, understandably, perhaps, the Tsar and Tsarina believed Rasputin to be sent by God himself. Meanwhile, Tsar Nicholas had just in that same year survived a sort of mini would-be revolution. There had been violence in the streets and mass strikes across the empire. Nicholas had been forced to make a lot of concessions to the people he formed a parliament, instituted free public press, and expanded civil rights pretty significantly. Really, the entire Romanov family had almost been deposed. Nicholas was lucky to still be A, in power, and B, alive. When Rasputin arrived, the Tsar was perhaps at his weakest point during his entire rule. He was looking for guidance, for answers, for help. And the Tsarina had long since believed Nicholas to be, well, kind of weak. She didn't find him incredibly fit to rule the empire. So when Rasputin showed up, the Tsar and Tsarina were both quite susceptible to his influence. For all of these reasons, the royal couple basically latched on to Rasputin. Immediately, they were swept up in his presence, and soon Rasputin would begin performing his now famous miracles. Around this time, Alexandra had given birth to her first son, Alexei. The child was born with hemophilia. This disorder was often called the royal disease. So many 20th century European royals had intermarried again and again that it was very common in the bloodline. Alexei inherited hemophilia from his mother. Hemophilia impairs the body's ability to make blood clots. So once you start bleeding, it's a lot harder to stop. This applies to injuries both external and internal. When Alexei fell or bumped himself, he began bleeding beneath the skin. He became swollen and distended. It was excruciatingly painful. The Tsar and Tsarina worried that this condition would eventually kill their son. It's often reported that Rasputin was brought into the palace because he could heal Alexei. This is not true. Rasputin was a spiritual advisor first and foremost. His healing ability had initially nothing to do with his involvement at the palace. But eventually, he became a healer for Alexei. 
No one really knows when this started, or when Rasputin even learned of Alexei's hemophilia. In fact, no one knows how many times, or how often, Rasputin healed Alexei. But there are a few definite accounts of this happening. In 1907, the Tsarina summoned Rasputin to pray over Alexei when the child was suffering from internal bleeding. Rasputin prayed, and the next day, Alexei recovered. In addition to healing her son, this incident also confirmed her biases. The Tsarina, like much of the aristocracy, had an almost fetishistic fascination with peasants like Rasputin. The incident would have proved this to be justified. The intelligentsia, the educated doctors, the elite religious men, they could do nothing to help Alexei. And then in comes this magical peasant, waves his hand, and the problem is solved. It's all very easy for Alexandra to believe, given her prejudices and beliefs in the occult. During the summer of 1912, Alexei had yet another hemorrhage. He was bleeding profusely, experiencing intense pain, and seemed pretty close to death. Alexandra even prepared an announcement for his death. The Tsarina telegrammed Rasputin, who was in Siberia at the time. She asked Rasputin to pray for Alexei. Rasputin wrote back quickly, God has seen your tears and heard your prayers. Do not grieve. The little one will not die. Do not allow the doctors to bother him too much. Shortly thereafter, Alexei's bleeding stopped. Doctors at the time said the recovery was entirely inexplicable. From that day on, the Tsarina saw Rasputin as a miracle worker. He quickly became her most trusted advisor. And so begins Rasputin's mystical, almost supernatural hold on the royals. Rasputin was more than a healer or an advisor. The royals saw him as a connection to the real people of Russia, to the working peasant class that they again had a tendency to fetishize. But however close he got to the palace, Rasputin was still a debaucherous pleasure seeker. This type of behavior was much more acceptable within the peasant class. Rasputin knew he had to hide that lifestyle from the royals, but it was easy enough for a long time. For one thing, the royal family basically never left their palace. They were secluded from the entirety of Russian society. There's a story that once the daughter of the Tsar actually went to a shop and paid a salesman for some merchandise. When presented with her change, the daughter was confused. She couldn't understand why the salesman was giving her money. Outside of the palace walls, Rasputin spent his days taking actresses and prostitutes to bathhouses. He drank and partied excessively. As devoutly religious as he really was, Rasputin enjoyed the pleasures of life. Rasputin didn't always stay in the city either, he traveled a lot. He seemed to prefer the agrarian Siberian countryside to St. Petersburg's more metropolitan landscape. Certainly his drinking and sexual deviance were more acceptable by the Siberians than the aristocrats in St. Petersburg. There's a story about Rasputin on his travels, perhaps one of the most famous stories. It's often used to describe just how wild and out of control he'd become. The story goes something like this. Rasputin visited a hotel in Moscow where he drank and danced long into the night. Outrageously drunk, he jumped onto a table and exposed himself to the entire hotel. He's said to have yelled, this is the altar at which the Tsarina worships. This infamous story is included in almost every biographic of Rasputin, but recent reporting has shown it to be completely false. The tale is usually attributed to reporting by secret police who were following Rasputin at the time, but when he combed through these police records as historian Douglas Smith did, there's just no mention of such an incident. These records show Rasputin went to the hotel, had a few glasses of wine, then left. But what Smith did find were letters. There's a police chief who hated Rasputin. Like many in the aristocracy, he saw Rasputin as a peasant who had just infiltrated their world. The chief took it upon himself to ruin Rasputin's credibility once and for all. In letters to his underlings, he specifically requested that they make up stories to paint Rasputin in a bad light. In these letters, the stories just get more and more outrageous. The police chief kept telling his people to make them worse and worse. At one point, Rasputin is at the center of a conspiracy to make millions selling the used underwear of military servicemen. The hotel incident is one of the many lies found in these letters. It just never happened. People also point to the memoirs from a British agent named Sir Bruce Lockhart. In these, Bruce claims he witnessed the entire thing, Rasputin getting drunk and exposing himself. But in Lockhart's personal diaries written while he stayed in Russia, there was no mention of any such incident. In fact, those diaries show he wasn't even in Moscow on the night he later said it happened. 
In truth, Lockhart just heard the story from someone and later added it to his own memoirs. When the police chief brought this made-up story to the Tsarina, she laughed it away. She could see that it was too ridiculous to be true. But from then on, whenever she heard actually true stories about Rasputin's conduct, of which there were plenty, she assumed they were just slander. Alexandra was so enraptured by Rasputin, and specifically his ability to heal Alexei, that she refused to believe he would conduct himself in that way. There have long been rumors that Alexandra and Rasputin had some sort of romantic affair. But those are exactly that. Rumors. There's no evidence to indicate that Rasputin was anything other than a close confidant, personal advisor, basically best friend. After the later Russian Revolution, government investigations came to the same conclusion. There was simply nothing to prove romance between the Tsarina and Rasputin. You could say that government wasn't trustworthy, but historians widely agree. They were just friends. There were likewise rumors about Rasputin having seduced the royal daughters. At one point, the daughter's tutor, Sofia Ivanova Ducheva, wanted Rasputin banned from the royal nursery. The Tsarina had her fired. Ducheva took her stories around the royal family, scandalizing high society as rumors began to swirl. Local newspapers printed cartoons of Rasputin seducing the Tsarina with her daughters nude in the background. There's been no evidence to indicate Rasputin ever slept with the Tsarina or her daughters. It almost definitely didn't happen. Regardless, this was when the tide began to turn on Rasputin. In 1914, Rasputin was approached by a woman named Chinoya Guseva outside of his St. Petersburg apartment. Guseva stabbed him in the stomach with a long dagger, screaming into his face, I've killed the Antichrist. Rasputin ran away, bleeding profusely as Chionya chased him down the street to attack him again. Eventually, he hit her in the face and got away. Stabbing, by all accounts, should have killed Rasputin. Even by today's standards, surviving a stab wound in the stomach is difficult. In 1914, it was almost impossible. Rasputin had a surgery and spent a long time in the hospital, during which doctors thought he'd probably die. Yet Rasputin miraculously recovered. Years prior, a priest named Sergei Trufanov had attempted to drive Rasputin out of the palace, only to fail and be exiled from St. Petersburg. Guseva was a follower of Trufanov. Although she claimed to act alone, Rasputin believed that the stabbing had been on Trufanov's orders. Guseva was declared not responsible due to insanity, and she was sentenced to an asylum. Although Rasputin survived, it was clear that the aristocracy was beginning to turn on him. You see, Rasputin had never been able to shake his peasant origins. Some St. Petersburg elites believed a peasant had no place in their society. Combined with the tales of his alcoholism and sexual deviance, they were clearly souring on Rasputin. Later in 1914, Russia declared war on Austria and Germany. In response, Rasputin wrote a prophecy in a letter to the Tsar. A terrible storm cloud lays over Russia. Disaster, grief murky darkness and no light, a whole ocean of tears, and so much blood. We will all drown in blood. The disaster is great. The misery is infinite. Rasputin went on to publicly double down on this vision, saying, if Russia goes to war, it will be the end of the monarchy, of the Romanovs, and of all Russian institutions. But at the time, Nicholas ignored Rasputin's words. After some difficulties in the war, the Tsar took control of the Russian military himself. And so he played a smaller role in the government. The Tsarina took over much of Nicholas's governing duties, often with Rasputin remaining as her most trusted advisor. In letters to her husband, the Tsarina parroted Rasputin's views and opinions. She advocated for Rasputin's increasing role in the government, referring to him as our friend. However, Nicholas was not very receptive to Rasputin's opinions. Today, it seems that Rasputin had a very, very minor influence in the governing of Russia during the war. Meanwhile, the war was going disastrously for Russia. Millions of Russian soldiers had died. Rumors began to swirl around the aristocracy, rumors blaming the Tsarina and Rasputin for the failing war efforts. The aristocracy could not grapple with the failure being Russia's own fault. So they became convinced that German spies were all around them. The Tsarina herself was German-born, so rumors began flying that she and Rasputin were both German spies. Today, there's been no evidence of this. 
German records indicate that they never contacted Rasputin. Still, the aristocrats had to blame someone. They couldn't blame Tsar Nicholas. That would be akin to a political and social suicide. They certainly couldn't stand to blame themselves. But here was this poor monk from a peasant's background who had tales of scandal permanently surrounding him. Rasputin was a peasant who had weaseled into the uppermost echelons of society. His mere existence was a threat to the aristocracy. Altogether, Rasputin was an excellent scapegoat. Within two years, the Russian parliament was talking openly about their hatred for Rasputin. Monarchist and ultra-nationalist Vladimir Puraskevich began a campaign of attack. He gave a speech in parliament saying that Rasputin was a puppeteer for the Russian government. Puraskevich said that Russia would never win the war while Rasputin lived. And this speech did not fall on deaf ears. To a certain group of aristocrats, it appeared that killing Rasputin was the only way to turn the tide of the war. Among that group was a young man named Felix Yusupov. The Yusupovs were the richest family in Russia, even richer than the ruling Romanovs themselves, so he had a lot of sway. Felix Yusupov gathered a set of conspirators, including Tsar Nicholas's cousin, Dmitry Pavlovich, and Vladimir Pereshkevich himself. Together, they set out to kill Grigory Rasputin. The story of Rasputin's death is something of legend. It usually goes something like this. Felix Yusupov telephoned Rasputin, inviting him to his home, the Moika Palace, for dinner. Flattered, Rasputin agreed and the three conspirators awaited his arrival in the palace's study. When Rasputin arrived, Yusupov led him to the basement apartment. There, Yusupov offered Rasputin wine and cakes that had all been laced with cyanide. Rasputin drank and drank, and he ate and ate. The cyanide had no effect on him whatsoever. Confused and worried, Yusupov pointed a revolver at Rasputin's chest. He shot Rasputin through the heart, and the peasant man collapsed on the ground. Yusupov and the conspirators left the palace and drove to Rasputin's apartment, intending to make it look like Rasputin had arrived home that night. They rearranged some stuff in the apartment and returned to the Moika Palace. Yusupov went down to the basement to make sure Rasputin was dead. Suddenly, Rasputin jumped violently onto all fours. Screaming and frenzied, Rasputin attacked Yusupov, who ran away up the stairs. Rasputin, crawling on all fours, made his way up the basement steps and out to the courtyard. Vladimir Pereskevich ran out to the courtyard and shot Rasputin twice. Rasputin collapsed in the snow. The conspirators wrapped Rasputin's body in cloth and dumped him in the Malaya Nevka River. Two days later, police found Rasputin's body frozen in the river. There have been rumors that he was alive when tossed into the river, but there's nothing to actually confirm this. Water was not found in his lungs, as has often been reported. Rasputin, degenerate womanizer and drunkard though he may have been, was little more than a scapegoat for the Russian aristocracy. So after they killed him, nothing really changed. Rasputin was a lot of things, but he wasn't the cause for all of Russia's problems. In fact, Rasputin's prophecies on the war proved to be eerily correct. That war did result in the downfall of Russia. And the Russian Revolution Tsar Nicholas, the Tsarina, and their children were taken into a basement and shot. The monarchy was destroyed, and Russian institutions were eventually ripped apart. Had Tsar Nicholas listened to Rasputin, the entire world today could be wildly different. It's an interesting what if. Felix Yusupov lured an unarmed man into a basement to kill him in cold blood. It was an act of cowardice, plain and simple. Indeed, the only account we have of the assassination comes from Yusupov himself. And to be honest, it reads like a man trying to justify his own murderous ambitions. A series of events paints Rasputin out to be this devilish, Luciferian figure who is unkillable. Meanwhile, Yusupov plays the heroic archangel, determined to destroy evil no matter how hard he must try. Given the context, it's not just unreliable, it's borderline unbelievable. But we'll never know the truth. Today, lies about Rasputin's life have spread like wildfires. But thanks to one historian, we're starting to get some genuine answers. For a long time, Rasputin was a purely mysterious figure in history. Lies, speculation defined his life. But recently, the historian Douglas Smith published a 900-page book about the man. 
In researching for his book, Smith traveled all across Russia, from Rasputin's birthplace of Pokrovskaya to the site of his death in St. Petersburg. He combed through previously undiscovered police records, journals, and personal diaries to put together a realistic, factual picture of Rasputin. Smith's book has been the main source of information for this video. Above all things, Rasputin was complicated. He was a drunkard. Rasputin loved little more than he loved wine. He was a serial sexual predator. Virtually any woman who sat down next to him would be groped and grabbed. Rasputin was accused of rape on at least one occasion. Throughout his life, he cheated on his wife perhaps hundreds of times. You could say he was a deranged madman. Rasputin believed he could heal those around him with the touch of his hands and often took money in exchange for doing so. But Rasputin was enormously generous, endlessly so. He casually accepted these bribes only to turn around, give that bribe money to beggars and peasants. By the measure of his time, Rasputin was immensely tolerant. He accepted homosexuality in the church and was accepting of Muslims and Jews, saying everyone was a child of God, searching for the same truth. Rasputin was a dedicated pacifist, warning against armed conflict repeatedly throughout his life. He was humble, proud to be a peasant, and favored the rural countryside to his large St. Petersburg apartment. It is my opinion that Rasputin cared little for the material things in life, but was infatuated by sensation. Sexual deviance, drunkenness, and fame all glittered in his eyes. I do not believe he was a good person, but I believe he had perhaps admirable traits. Historical figures are not characters or cartoons. They're just people. They're messy and complicated. These are just guesses, though, and my assessment of Rasputin as a man should hold very little weight. Informed though my thoughts may be, Rasputin and the legend of Rasputin have been very intentionally constructed. On one side, you had the aristocratic conservatives who hated Rasputin. He was a peasant who had no sense of propriety and had sniveled his way into their world. They did not want nor need any other common people seeing his example and following suit. So, the aristocracy worked hard to spread any potentially damaging rumor or anecdote about Rasputin. But in response, the progressive commoners did the same. The more the aristocrats hated Rasputin, the more these people heroized him. The tales of his generosity and humbleness may be just as exaggerated as those of his deviance. Rasputin and his persona fit right into the cultural context of his time, for better or for worse. The Russian people were massively interested in figures like Rasputin, figures of the occult, of the mystical. There was a sense in Russia that the devil walked among men in a very real way. The famed artist Mikhail Vrubel painted demon after demon. The composer Alexander Skriabin believed that the devil was genuinely working through his music. These were big names and Rasputin fit in well. Still, one question remains. How was Rasputin able to heal Alexei? No one really knows. To this day it remains a mystery and likely always will. Primary sources on the subject are all contradictory. Some say he had no effect on the boy's health. Others say he could wave his hand and miraculously stop Alexei's bleeding. There are also theories, almost certainly untrue, that his healing was some part of a conspiracy. These theories posit that Rasputin was working with a woman named Anna Virubova, who was a close confidant of the queen. Allegedly, Rasputin and Virubova would give Alexei poison to induce bleeding. This would cause the Tsarina to panic and call upon Rasputin to heal her son. Virubova and Rasputin would stop administering the poison. Alexei would become healthy again, and it would appear that Rasputin's mystical powers were at play. There's no evidence to indicate this conspiracy theory is true at all. It is yet another legend. It's been speculated that the doctors were giving the boy aspirin, which we now know is a blood thinner. Rasputin often ordered the doctors to leave Alexei alone. By disallowing the use of aspirin, Rasputin may have inadvertently helped Alexei's blood clot faster. Again though, just speculation. Perhaps the best possible explanation, and it too is just speculation, is one of the mind-body connection. Today scientists are learning more about how one's mental state can genuinely affect their physical body. If Alexandra truly believed Rasputin could heal her son, Alexei would likely have felt that same sense of security. This could have resulted in basically a placebo effect. 
Even if we ignore every single half-truth and maybe lie about Rasputin, we are left with a truly incredible life story. Here we have an anonymous peasant who should have died in a ditch, but instead he literally walked from a field right into the royal palace. He rose from the lowest dredges of society to sit next to the throne, purely on the merits of his own will. If there was a case for genuine prophecy, perhaps it could be made in Rasputin. Whether he was exceedingly intelligent or something more, cannot be denied that his predictions about the fall of Russia and the death of the royal family were absolutely entirely correct. That alone is verifiable, and I think pretty remarkable. Rasputin was villainous and cunning. He could be good, but he was not a good man. He was powerful in ways history has rarely seen and that logic struggles to explain. There are a lot of lies about Grigory Yefimovich Rasputin, but to make an incredible, perhaps horrifying, tale of his life, all we need to do is tell the truth.